Fun. Welcome back. We're glad to have everybody back, and we're glad to have our guest minister today, Reverend David McDonald. If you'll look over to your left. All right, most of you, that's your other left that way. And so Reverend David McDonald is here, so we're glad to have him back with us today. Please get a copy of the bulletin. You have a couple of announcements. Um, you see circle number one will not meet this month. Choir practice. So Randy, what is our... Seven o'clock Wednesday night. Very good. All right. We'll check out Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Drive. We will change for September, and you see the list of items there that are um, needed for that. But can they also give August and July event on um, things? And so we'll still do the other things too, so you can still contribute. So we want to keep on working on this. There's a note here with the Fellowship and Nurture Committee. We'll like to meet with Christian Education on September 12th, right after worship. Um, so please make a note of that if you're on either one of those committees. Do we have other announcements that I have forgotten about? I have concerns. Um, Linda, how's your Texas crowd? Oh, no. So our prayers need to be with um, Oh wow. Well, I would say then that we would we would want to include in our prayers all the COVID victims and COVID families and the way it's been affecting so many different people. And also keep in your thoughts and prayers all of your health care workers, the health care workers that are so in the middle of all this and so in danger. And so um, we'll keep all of them. Um, we also, we added back Ella Jane. Ella Jane Pruitt's not feeling well, and so we need to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Your other names have been all been put on here for a reason, please pay attention to those. Let's include um, the people that are affected by the storm last week, the Louisiana people. Um, let's, uh, let's keep them in our thoughts and prayers, as well as all the people of Afghanistan, as well as the military people that are still affected by those events. And so let's please keep, let's use our, our circle widely for our prayers. And with that, let us worship. Uh, yes, ma'am. Linda Arp. We had her on our prayer list for a while. So Linda Arp, keep that family in our thoughts and prayers. And with that, let us worship.
Greetings, it's good to be back with you. I trust you all are doing well. We certainly keep all the prayer concerns that we have heard this morning before us. Since we last got together, my daughter Elizabeth and Brendan Grants were married in Wilmington at the Arboretum and they're now in Knoxville, Tennessee. She's a traveling physical therapist. Her 13 weeks end on the 15th of this month and they're headed to Wausau, Wisconsin. Boy, is that gonna be a change for them. <laughs> but they are enjoying their time together. Come, let us worship God. Clap your hands and shout for joy. God rules over heaven and earth. God rules to bring us new life. Lead your church, O Holy Spirit. Teach us your ways, give us your wisdom. Please be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ calls us to come and worship him. And as part of worship, we confess our sins together. Let us gather in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let us come into the presence of the Lord God, confessing our sins silently. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin 
and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You may be seated. As we come into the presence of God and prepare to hear the word of God read as it is found in scripture, let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 67. Listen now for the word of the Lord. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Here ends the reading from the Psalms. May the Lord add his blessing to it. Thanks be to God. Our reading from the gospel this morning is taken from the seventh chapter of the book of Mark, beginning in verse 24. Listen now for the word of God. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet, he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician in origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on bed, and the demon gone. Then he entered the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment of speech and they begged him to say and lay his hand on him. He took him aside, away from the crowd, put his fingers into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, that is, be opened. 
And immediately his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Here ends this portion of Mark's gospel. May the Lord add his blessing to it. Just prior to the telling of these two stories back to back, Jesus and the disciples have been having a bit of a controversy with the Jewish authorities. And the topic had to do with what is clean and what is unclean. And so Mark then steps in to this next passage as we look to it today. The disciples and Jesus are accused of failing to observe the purity laws and the cleaning laws of the holy religion in Jerusalem. As, Je as Jesus begins his journey from there, he needs to have some time away. They have been very, very busy. There have been people coming from all sides of the Sea of Galilee. And even when he goes into the neighboring countryside or across the sea, they have followed him there. He has not had a moment hardly to speak or to pray. And so he's looking for some time away. And he goes, like most of us would like to go, or as I live, by the sea. Tyre and Sidon are seaports. He goes there because they are far away from the mainland, so to speak. You might think of them sort of as barrier islands, even if they are attached. And so Jesus and his disciples go, hoping that they can outrun the news. And as today, the media always seems to catch up with them, as it does with most of us. He wants some time alone with his disciples as he prepares them for what's coming. For he knows already at this midpoint in the book of Mark that the cross's shadow is dead ahead and they can no more outrun it than we could outrun the wind. And the two stories are very interesting because neither this man nor this child who were wanted in polite society. They were on the far outskirts of the known world as far as most Jews were concerned. And yet, they were moved to be free and to rejoice, free from their afflictions as Jesus comes to them. At least two writers of commentaries on this passage, Paul Ochtemeyer and Will Willimon, Dr. Ochtemeyer from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, under whom I had an opportunity to study, and also Dr. William Williman over here at Duke and Bishop in the Methodist Church, note how strange this itinerary is. Picture for a moment, you've got Tyre and Sidon by the seacoast, and you've got the mainland of Israel, and you've got the Sea of Galilee down here, and outside that is the Capitalists. And they're going from here to there and back again. That seems like a strange itinerary to most of us. And yet, as it has been pointed out, this may be spiritual geography. Now, a lot of Young people don't like geography. Remembering all those states and capitals and all those nations and their capitals is not something a lot of young people like. Some of us did it because we had to do it. 
but by the time you're an adult, you've kind of forgotten where some of those capitals are or even where some of those nations are. And since I was in school, the nationhood has changed dramatically, and it's changing once again with Afghanistan. Jesus is on the move. He's in the outer parts of the world as far as his disciples are concerned. The villages of Caesarea Philippi and the Sea of Galilee are long since out of the way. And here we have two very unusual people. Having heard that Jesus could heal and having a very sick daughter, this Syrophoenician woman, we are not even told her name, comes to Jesus, drops down before him and begs him to heal her daughter. And Jesus says one of those things that's almost counterintuitive. I have come that the children of Israel might hear. And she says, Lord, say the word, and she shall be healed. And indeed it happened. What she knows is that although she is ritually unclean by being a Gentile, and while she is well outside the bounds of normal Israel, that if she can get Jesus to say the word, even the crumbs of his table shall bring healing to this Gentile, and she shall become one of the family. Isn't it amazing what we remember from our childhood and crumbs? My parents were in Camden, South Carolina. My dad was an electrical engineer for the DuPont plant there, and he moved there. And I can remember my parents building a house there. My mom loved birds. She was a member of the Carolina Bird Club and the Audubon Society, and she just enjoyed birds, and she fed them as much as she could. Some of you are nodding. I can tell you enjoy bird watching too. I do. And she would throw bread out at the back of the lot for the songbirds. And one day, it kept disappearing. And at last, back on the very edge of the lot, a little black lab mixed breed appeared. And so she threw out some more bread, and it disappeared. He was obviously a very hungry little dog, sort of medium size, not big, not big as a black lab. And my brother and I were dispatched regularly with another plate full of bread to throw out so the birds could get some at least, even though we knew where a lot of it was going. And after several days, the dog began to get more comfortable. Now my dad was away on a business trip and he was going to be gone for about a week. And this little mixed breed kept getting more and more comfortable being around the two of us and my mother. And one day he just sort of followed us on to the back porch. We hardly knew he was there. And in another couple of days, he'd made himself at home on an old couch my grandmother had brought and left on the back porch. One of those you can do anything you want to as a kid, and we usually did. We ate and spilled things, and no telling what that stray smelled. And eventually, of course, my dad returned from his trip, and as he stepped through the back door, you can guess. The dog roared, and my dad looked at him and said, well, this is a fine thing, this is my house. And my mother said, you may think it's your castle, but he thinks he's Duke of the castle. 
and the name stuck ever after. We called him Duke. And he became a friend of the family. Long, long, long years later, he would eventually die, but he was the first dog I remember. <laughs> and very special. And I think back, too, about my dad on weekends. He used to grab the box of Bisquick out of the cupboard, and on the side of it, there's something called crumb cake. Some of you may have remembered that recipe or even done it yourself. And if he could, my dad would get fresh blueberries from some Carolina farm, and he'd mix them in, and all that was so good. Even the crumbs were good of the crumb cake. And my grandmother, not to be outdone, could take a little bit of anything, make something out of it, it seems. If all we had was a can of tomato soup, she made tomato soup cupcakes. I don't know exactly what all went into it now, but it was a can of tomato soup and maybe a half cup or a cup of raisins and some pumpkin spice and so on and some flour. And when she got through, they were some of the best cupcakes you've ever had. And I remember them to this day. But the point is, families gather around the table and even the special things that we do out of a little bit of nothing of crumbs make us remember and we can smell and taste them decades later just as if they were being made today. And that's sort of what this lady is thinking as she joins this group. And as we used to say, in seminary on occasion, Jesus just found a sheepdog. And he, she is hurting all the unbelievers. She may be astray, she may not be appropriate at the table, but she's a member of the family. And everyone will remember her for long after this story happened. The disciples were having first-hand experience of being out of their comfort zone because there is no way these Galilean fishermen and a tax collector would ever find comfort in Tyre and Sidon. That's where the great calamities happened. That's where the refugees went when they didn't want to be found. And as I was thinking this week, I thought of how strange it is of where people get settled and how they become associated and folks they know. Some of you may remember that my second church in Virginia was in Petersburg at the back gate of Fort Lee. And we had some military folk there. In fact, the, at the time I was there, the commanding general at Fort Lee was a member of the congregation. And that's a quartermaster station. That's where you get fed. Now, if you want to get a good meal, go to Fort Lee when they're having their cook-off. And all the chefs throughout the services are competing. You will get some food you will have never tasted before, and it will be extremely good. And I thought about those Afghan refugees going there probably for at least a while, and they will be welcome. Because most of the congregation at the time I was there were TDY, they call it, temporary deployment. They became familiar with the church, you got to know them, and then they were gone. And then here comes another group. They know how to handle something new happening. I remember, for example, that a young lady, a college student from Fayetteville State, happened to be African American, came to worship with us, and she got involved with youth groups. And one time they were sitting discussing about the terrible traffic going between Petersburg and Richmond on I-95. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. And she said, ugh, oh, that's nothing. My mother is the preschool director at First Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles. 
and you just ain't seen nothing so you've been on the freeway at rush hour. And it reminded us how small this world is and as busy as it gets and how strange as it may be, we have common points of interest. So the Syrophoenician woman is one example. But I haven't forgotten about that spit yet. By any nationality to spit in one's face as an affront and asking for a fight or worse. And here's Jesus and this crowd of folk are bringing this man who hasn't spoken a word since who knows when. They're not sure if he can hear and he sticks his fingers in his ears, and then he spits on his fingers and touches the man's tongue. And almost immediately he begins to speak. Now talking about being unclean, in this day of pandemics, we would be horrified, wouldn't we? If someone touched their tongue and touched somebody else's tongue, it would just be the greatest surprise of all. But healing was in that touch. And this man was excited, but it was also the group that brought him. They were so excited, they just couldn't stop for joy. Jesus told them, hey, you're going to get me in trouble. This is going to be a madhouse. Please don't say anything. And they just kept right on proclaiming joyfully. And so as the disciples learned, when you're in the outback, when you're way away from everybody, strange things may happen when you're with Jesus. But rejoice, because some of the things you never thought you would see and some of the things that you never thought could happen may happen, and the Spirit of God is going to work in that way in the strangeness and the oddities of life. And we are in that type of time now. A couple of years ago, most of us would never have thought about wearing masks to church. That seems like a contradiction. You want to see your friends. You want to meet new people. You want to see strangers that come. You want to share what has been good and happening and new. And here we are. And yet, we are now going online. Our services can be seen in any number of different ways. Churches are having to change. They're having to adapt. And Clarkton is doing it, and doing it pretty well. And I was so glad to see it. Life in the church will never be the same again. It will be new, it will be different, but it can be a good thing. It's interesting that the word the man uses to describe this man's condition is used in the Greek Septuagint, that is the Greek version of the Bible, in only one other place. And it's in the 35th chapter of Isaiah. Listen now to what Isaiah has to say. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless shall sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. A haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. 
Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Marvelous. Centuries before Jesus was born, even longer before the close of the New Testament in Revelation, but Sadness and joy shall flee away is just as common in the world of Revelation 21 as it is in the time of Jesus or in the time of Isaiah. We are marked and called forgiven, not by ourselves, not by what we do, but by Christ himself. We may be feeling like we are Gentile dogs, we don't belong there, and yet the church is discovering that people of all kinds want to be a part of a new community, a community that understands and forgives them. There's a marvelous article in the Presbyterian Outlook this month about a new worshiping community, and it had the church had died. It was a marvelous old sanctuary. And a young lady was called to be the pastor. And she didn't know what else to do, so she started getting out and talking to people in the neighborhood and asking them, what do you need? And all of a sudden, there were folks coming to sit together and talk. Talk about the Bible, talk about their family, talk about their children, talk about all kinds of things. The pews went, and it became like a living room where folks could gather and talk what was on their mind. In some ways, I see that happening now with this virtual technology that we have. We can gather and talk online. No, it may not be quite as satisfying as it would be to join people in person. But until we can, it is a great way to catch up with one another. And it is a great way to share the gospel. The Syrophoenician woman was ecstatic that her child was healed. And the man who had understood so much but could not hear properly and could not speak, suddenly became able to sing, and all his friends rejoiced, and they sang together. A marvelous, glorious image as Jesus prepares to go to the cross with all of its sadness, with all of its difficulty. The disciples were reminded that one day they would gather and sing and proclaim the good of the Lord's presence among them. Jesus is in Tyre. He's in Sidon. He's in all the out-of-the-way places of the Decapolis. Yes, he would like to be home in Galilee with all his friends, his fishing buddies, his carpenter friends, all his neighbors. But until he can be there again, he will rejoice in what the Lord has given him. This is not a geographical mistake that Mark has made. It's a theological point. We keep the communion here in the table in the sanctuary for a reason, to remind us of the Lord's broken body, of the crumbs that are left and will become part of the worship in a new time and place. And though sparse may it seem, the cup will overflow for many people. It is here that the worshiping community is reminded of the crumbs and that even the Gentiles, even those who seem far away from the church, are welcome. The story is told in Great Britain the wonderful hero and magnificent military leader, Duke Wellington, was going to church. And he 
knelt at the altar as is their tradition to receive communion. And an old man who had long since lost his livelihood, very poor and in, we would call it rags, came up and knelt beside him. And the warden of the parish came and was motioning him to move down. And it is said that the Duke reached out and grabbed his hand. Stay, for we are all equal in his sight here. Now we may have Dukes and we may have Kings and Queens. We may have Congressmen and we may have Presidents, but at the table, we are all equal. Let us remember and go forth singing and proclaiming joy from this day forth and forevermore. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we are often befuddled by where you appear. We often don't know what on earth you had put us in this time and place for. We seem tired, we seem weak, we seem afflicted with various difficulties and medical problems, and this world which we once knew we thought is so different than the world in which we live now and which we are leaving to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Sometimes it is almost overwhelming. But as we remember that it is not our work but yours, we are reminded how great it is that your spirit works among us, not for the benefit of any one, but for the benefit of all. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Gather with us now as we continue to minister in the world around us. We pray for one another. Let us rejoice and sing. Please join me as we come together affirming our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
from whence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray for one another for the prayer concerns in the bulletin and for those in our mind. O oh God, we gather today because of your good news in Jesus Christ, manifested in your love for us. In Jesus, you have given us the perfect example for our living and for our serving. In him, your suffering is for the sake of the whole world, and it is revealed in him. In him, your indignation for the sinful world is revealed. In him, we see true courage that became visible in his journey to the cross. We are thereby inspired to move forward boldly, bravely, even brazenly, and to let no fear interfere with the proclamation of the gospel by word and by deed. O oh God, strengthen us, we pray, in our capacity to emulate the one who shepherds us, who calls us by name, and sends us forth to take your word of love to every year. The world around us is filled with many who do not know the news, who have not heard it proclaimed, nor shared the joy with those who have been touched and transformed by its wonder. Help us by faithful discipleship to live in such a way that the gospel's truth can not be hidden, and that your grace becomes wondrous and wisdom. And thus we pray as you instructed your disciples when they gathered to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, we would not deny you and your loving generosity toward us by keeping silent, by hoarding your blessings, spiritual or material. We offer gifts of word, works, and resources as a visible witness of our commitment to share what we have been given with those who are hungry in body or soul. Receive this offering with our gratitude for your love and care for us all. Amen. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before his presence with rejoicing to the only Lord our God, through Jesus Christ his Son, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority that was from the beginning of time, is now, and shall ever be. Amen. Amen. 